Last month, we revisited some cool British singles released in March 1966. Now, it's time to do the same with April of that year, and April 1966 was a particularly great month for singles. So, without further ado, let's explore some cool British singles released that month. Wild Thing was the Trog's second single. Their debut single, released in early 1966, was a flop, and the original version of Wild Thing, which was recorded by American band The Wild Ones in 1965, was also a flop. So it seemed very unlikely that the Trog's second single would become a hit. Journalist Penny Valentine, who seemed to have an uncanny ability to predict which tunes would become hits, was the only journalist who predicted that the song was going to become a success. Penny Valentine wrote, Wild Thing by the Trogs, stopped me in my tracks. Written by Chip Taylor, it has been well made, has indecently insinuating phrasing, and it's a rave, a hit. The song was indeed a success. It was not only the Trogs' biggest hit but also one of the biggest hits of 1966. The single reached number two in Britain and number one in the States, and it was also a top 10 hit in more than 15 countries. The Trog's Back to Basics approach proved to be a great success, but this was far from the wildest British single released in April 1966. The following single is not only the wildest single released that month, but probably one of the wildest British singles released in 1966 as a whole. The world is the Some sources erroneously claim that future David Bowie guitarist Mick Ronson provided the aggressive fuzz guitar sounds featured on this song. But Ronson joined the band shortly after the release of this single and didn't play on the track. The story of the voice is quite unusual. Several members of the group were members of a religious cult. And the song's apocalyptic lyrics were apparently influenced by the message that their religious cult used to preach. Mick Ronson and drummer Dave Bradfield, who both hailed from Hull, joined the group shortly after the single was recorded. But they soon found themselves out of work when the religious group decided to move to the Bahamas in June 1966. The single only managed to get this small review from Record Mirror, and it went pretty much unnoticed. But wait, did I say this was the wildest single of the month? Maybe I was wrong after all, have a listen to this. This Way Out track by a band called The Buzz was produced by genius British producer Joe Meek. Meek hadn't had a hit since early 1964, when the Honeycombs topped the charts with the song Have I the Right. But the lack of success didn't stop him from continuing to experiment with his DIY production techniques and coming up with weird and unusual sounds. The Buzz originally hailed from Edinburgh, and just like many bands from that era, they moved to London in search of fame and fortune. This was the band's second single, and it's definitely one of the wildest and most way out freakbeat tunes from that period. You ain't helping me, you're holding me down. Not surprisingly, the song went over the heads of the record buying public. But this wasn't the only Joe Meek production which saw the light of the day in April 1966. This track is another example of a song that could only come out of Meek's studio. It wouldn't be strange to mistake it for a new wave recording from the late 70s or early 80s. The sound is so unusual that it doesn't even sound like a 60s recording. It somehow sounds as if this track lived in its own decade. But perhaps the most unusual and weird sounding part of the song comes after the first chorus. Record Mirror wrote, Fairly strong beat group song written by the boys with delayed vocal intro. Strong beat and a reasonably commercial song, but it could get lost. None of these singles managed to chart, but April 1966 also saw the release of quite a few singles that became hits. You're out there playing your heartless games, sorrow, sorrow. 
By 1966, most Liverpool bands who enjoyed success in the early 60s had already disbanded or were fading in popularity. The Mersey Beats had enjoyed some popularity in 1963 and 1964, but the group disbanded in 1965 due to lack of success. In early 1966, Tony Crane and Billy Kinsley decided to update their image and sound and formed a duo called the Merseys. Their first single, Sorrow, was recorded at CBS Studios in London, and it was produced by Kit Lambert, manager of The Who. The Merseys were backed by a truly stunning lineup of musicians, Jimmy Page on guitar, Jack Bruce on bass, and Clem Catini on drums. As a curious note, a line from the song is included in the track It's All Too Much by The Beatles, released in 1969 as part of the Yellow Submarine soundtrack album. Sorrow became a big success, reaching number four in Britain and staying in the top 20 for several weeks. Later in 1973, David Bowie covered the song and released it as a single. His version of the song reached number three in Britain, and it also became Bowie's first number one in Australia. And speaking of David Bowie, I'll do anything you say. Do Anything You Say was the first single solely credited to David Bowie. His previous 45s had either been released as Davy Jones or as David Bowie in the lower third. The single was recorded at Marble Arch Studios in London and produced by Tony Hatch. Do Anything You Say was a good song which seemed very influenced by the mod sounds from that era. But the track wasn't as promising or imaginative as the other singles that Bowie released in 1966. Record Mirror wrote, Self-penned coupling with the top decker Pacey Beater and Piano Backed Plus group. Seen for David's undoubted talents. He sings well and he deserves a hit. The B-side was a song called Good Morning Girl. The single failed to chart. Curiously enough, Many musicians who reached success in the 70s released singles in April 1966. Rod Stewart released a decent enough cover of Shake by Sam Cooke. Like the song featured Brian Auger on organ and a great soulful vocal by Rod the Mod. But the record went pretty much unnoticed. Episode 6 were another band which featured musicians who would find bigger success later in the 70s. The group featured future Deep Purple members Ian Gillan on vocals and Roger Glover on bass. I Hear the Trumpets Blow was a good cover of the Tokens number, but the original version by the Tokens was released in Britain the same month as this cover, and both versions failed to chart. Future Deep Purple organist John Lord also released a new single in April 1966 with his band The Artwood. Apart from John Lord, The Artwoods also featured Ronnie Wood's older brother on vocals. Their April 1966 release was a cover of the soul classic I Take What I Want. Their version sounded very similar to many American garage groups from that era. The B-side was an instrumental number with probably the longest title of 1966. Yeah, that's fine, my grandma wants to play violin, but listen, please. This wasn't one of the band's best singles, but the Artwoods were an excellent band who unfortunately never reached the success they deserved. Ah, now, now, chaps. Um, I'm looking for a saxophonist, you see, doubling French... <laughs> This was one of the Pretty Things' greatest singles, and perhaps the wildest as well. The A-side of this 45 features one of the nastiest sounding fuzz guitars ever recorded. And the B-side was another excellent song called LSD, which ended up becoming a big favorite among fans of the Pretties. Of course, the lyrics of the song led to different interpretations. Everybody's talking about my LSD. The 
single got great reviews in the press. Derek Johnson from the New Musical Express even featured the record as single of the week. But not everyone shared the same opinion. Journalist Penny Valentine wrote, There's a filthy sounding guitar on this song, which was written by among others JJ Jackson. The Pretty Things release few records these days, and somehow I wish they would drop this sound of theirs to make the wait worthwhile. It has an ugly arrangement, and the great moving sound on it is rather wasted. I suppose they've become identified with this rather anti-sound. It's rather a shame. LSD could mean many things in the flip. The single stalled at number 43 in the UK. Some sweet day. April 1966 also saw the release of one of Manfred Mann's biggest hits. Their previous two singles hadn't even entered the charts in Britain, and the Manfreds were in desperate need of a hit. Pretty Flamingo exceeded all expectations. The single reached number one in the UK, number three in Australia, and it also became a top ten hit in several European countries. In the States, it stalled at number 28. The song featured Jack Bruce on bass, who joined the band during that period. As a curious note, Lou Reed considered Pretty Flamingo to be one of his all-time favorite singles. The Manfreds always seemed to have a split personality. Most of their singles were blatantly commercial pop songs aimed at the charts. But many of their B-sides and extended plays featured the band experimenting with more challenging sounds, in some cases even approaching avant-garde territory. Apart from the Pretty Flamingo single, Manfred Mann also released four new songs in April 1966. The leading song from the EP was a song called Machines which definitely seemed to be influenced by avant-garde music from that period. Machines, machines, they keep right on going. The lyrics of the song spoke about how humans will eventually become slaves to the machines that they originally built to serve them. A slave, a slave to the machine, machine. Undoubtedly, the lyrics ring more true nowadays than they did in 1966. One of the most often discussed topics in the music press throughout April 1966 was the Rolling Stones' new album Aftermath, which was released that month. The record got excellent reviews in the press, and as usual, many bands and artists covered songs from the album and released them as singles. Searchers hadn't had a hit since February 1965, and they hoped a Stone song would bring them back to the chart. It wasn't a big hit, but at least it saw the band returning to the British charts, something they hadn't managed to do with their last few singles. The Searchers recorded a good cover of the song, but it was very close to the original version, so it didn't really add much to it. To my ears, the highlight was the B-side. Oh, The song featured a gorgeous piano that dominated the whole track. The single only managed to reach number 31 in the UK, but it became a big hit in Australia, where it reached number 8. The song achieved its highest position in the Netherlands, peaking at number 5. Back then, it was very common for artists and bands to cover album tracks by the Beatles and the Stones and release them as singles. Most covers were usually average and nothing special, but there were always a few exceptions. In April 1966, a band called Bow Street Runners released a great soul-flavored cover of Drive My Car by the Beatles. The band featured future Fleetwood Mac member Mick Fleetwood on drums. Derek Johnson from the New Musical Express wrote, Yet another Lennon-McCartney number from the Rubber Soul LP. The runners steep it much more deeply in the R&B idiom than on the original Beatles recording. An inspired fruity voiced solo supported by some harmony passages, plus organ and a contagious stamp beat. Congrats to the boys for changing the basic style so completely, but unfortunately, it's not one of the Beatles' best numbers. The single failed to chart. I'm the door of every house, in every street. In every town, Another band who made their entrance in the British music scene with a Beatles cover was the St. Louis Union. 
The group's first single was a cover of Girl by the Beatles which surprisingly became a big success, reaching number 11 in the UK. Their second single was this excellent Graham Gouldman composition called Behind the Door. By April 1966, Gouldman had already written several hits for bands such as the Yardbirds, the Hollies and Herman's Hermits. Behind the Door got excellent reviews in the British press, and journalist Penny Valentine even picked it as single of the week for Disc Magazine. But despite the good reviews and despite the quality of the song, the single didn't chart. Later in the 70s, keyboardist Dave Tomlinson changed his name to Dave Formula, and he joined the magazine, the post-punk band from Manchester. He also became a member of New Romantics band Visage, and he remained in the group until the mid-80s. Songwriter Graham Goldman also reached bigger success later in the 70s when he formed the band 10CC. And speaking of 10CC, right. 10CC member Eric Stewart got his start in music in the early 60s as a member of Wayne Fontana and the Mindbenders. Fontana left the band in 1965 to start a solo career, and Eric Stewart took over on vocals. And the band actually managed to score one of their biggest hits without Wayne Fontana, a groovy kind of love, reached number two in late 1965. This single from April 1966 was the follow-up to a groovy kind of love. It failed to replicate the success of their previous hit, but it still managed to reach the top 30 in Britain. This is probably the first British pop song to display strong influences of pet sounds by the Beach Boys. Certain parts of the track are slightly reminiscent of the song That's Not Me by the Beach Boys. The single stalled at number 28. Wimple Winch only managed to release three singles during their brief existence. But the band released some of the toughest and most aggressive singles from the psychedelic era. This was their first single. It wasn't as good as some of their later 45s such as Save My Soul or Rumble on Mersey Square South. But it was a good single that already pointed the way towards their later sonic assaults. Similarly, the Cubas also released plenty of great singles in the mid to late 60s but they never managed to become a household name. You Better Make Up Your Mind was an excellent song that seemed to merge soul music with the emerging freakbeat sound of that era. But unfortunately, the song didn't make the charts. You complain about the new world you ain't done so good yourself. The Soros were one of many British bands who emigrated to other European countries in order to find success and escape the major competition that existed in Britain. The band moved to Italy and became fairly successful there, with several of their singles released in both Italian and English. Let the Love Leaf was a good R&B number that managed to get some excellent reviews in the press. But once again, the single didn't chart. You don't love me, baby, and you don't have to love me at all. <laughs> And last but not least, Felder's Orioles were one of many mod bands who enjoyed a fair amount of popularity in clubs but never quite managed to have any chart appeal. Their single release from April 1966 was an excellent soul-flavored mod number which meant nothing in the charts. However, the song has appeared on several mod compilations over the years and has become a minor classic among fans of mod sounds from the mid-60s. I hope you enjoyed this trip back to April 1966. See you next time.